Uh, thank you to the President for bringing the schedule of this meeting on to British rather than Italian time, much appreciated by those of us that have travelled across the Channel to, uh, to be here. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about eventually is RNA and epigenetics, uh, but I realise that I'm here in Italy and so there, uh, there's an opportunity actually to link the content of my talk with a topic that I know is considered very much here in Italy, which is opera. So we should be getting some sound. So you all know that this is um, uh, Madame Butterfly. Um, and this is Butterfly singing here. And I have to say, I went to a performance of Butterfly recently and I was reduced to tears. I was reduced to tears not because the singing was beautiful, but it was. Not because I knew that there was a tragic end to the story, but there is. But I was reduced to tears because there's a feature in the plot which is incompatible with Mendelian genetics. And the part of the plot which is incompatible with Mendelian genetics if we could turn the sound off, thank you, is um, when Butterfly makes the case that B.F. Pinkerton is the father of her child. She says, I'm Japanese, I've got dark eyes. Everybody in Japan has got dark eyes. Pinkerton has got blue eyes. My son has got blue eyes. She says, this must mean that Pinkerton is the father, but you know, that if she's from Japan and everybody in Japan has dark eyes, that there's no way that a blue-eyed father could produce a blue-eyed child. But what I have to tell you in my talk today will reconcile Puccini's plot with uh, Mendelian, well, with uh, genetics and science. So I'm going to tell you the story of B.F. Pinkerton's blue-eyed baby. Uh, uh, this is, these are the collaborators on the work. Some of the work I'm going to talk about today has been a collaboration with Joe Ecker's lab in the Salk Institute. Um, other work is uh, by these individuals, in particular Quentin Guil, who's a very talented uh, PhD student, now postdoc, uh, moved to Australia. Now, one thing I realize is I'm probably the only person in the room here who works with plants. Are there any other plant biologists here? No, not a single one. So, and I anticipated this, so I realized that what I need to do before I start is to justify why should you bother listening to me for the next half an hour or so. And I would refer back to what uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques Monod said uh, to justify his work on Escherichia coli. He said, what's true for E. coli is also true for elephants. Actually, he would have had a much better alliteration, and it would also have been true if he said what is true for peas, petunias, and other plants is also true for people. The point is um, that when we're dealing with fundamental processes in biology, it really often doesn't matter which organism or type of organism you're looking at. Uh, what you're able to do is to uncover some mechanisms that are um, universally applicable. And so whether or not what I'm going to tell you about today is universally applicable is for you to decide. But I think there is a possibility that there could be some grains of truth in what I'm going to be talking about. Now, the big question uh, that we are trying to um, get into in my lab is related to the relationship between epigenetics and natural variation. I think this is an appropriate topic for me to be researching because my position in Cambridge University is professor of botany. One of my predecessors in this role was a certain J.S. Henslow, and he was Darwin's tutor. Um, 
J.S. Hensler was very interested in variation within species. He was a clergyman, he was a priest, uh, and so he was prevented by his religion uh, from making the transition uh, between an understanding of natural variation and the transmutation of species, which his religion would have ruled out. Uh, Darwin, his pupil, um, was able to make that transition eventually. So what we're interested in is natural variation. Where does natural variation come from? We know that it often comes from genetic variation, but does epigenetics play a role? So that's the question um, that we have been addressing in our work. So what I'm going to tell you about today is that epigenetic changes can be heritable between generations. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of RNA in epigenetics. I'm going to tell you that RNA can actually move between cells. We used to think of RNA as a molecule that stayed within cells, maybe moved from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and perhaps back again. Um, but um, we now know that it moves between cells. I'm going to talk about epigenetic drive, non-Mendelian inheritance, and this is where we come to B.F. Pinkerton's baby. I'm going to talk about hybridization and how the process of hybridization between different, relate, different organisms uh, can induce epigenetic change. And I'm going to raise a question about hidden heritability. So it's often difficult to assign all of the heritability um, of a quantitative trait in particular to genetics. And I'm going to raise the question as to whether epigenetics could feature here. So what I'm going to tell you about, I'll give you a bit of um, background here, is a story that we embarked on many years ago uh, when we were making uh, genetically modified plants that were resistant against um, virus disease, or the aim was to make plants that were resistant against virus disease. And the approach we took was a sort of genetic vaccination approach. So the idea was that we would take a gene from a virus, we would express it in a transgenic plant, and then ask the question, is that plant resistant against the virus disease? The answer was that it often was, but we often had an unexpected result, as summarized in this slide here. So we had in any one transgenic experiments, some plants that carried the transgene, but they were not resistant against the virus disease. We had other plants, um, and the transgene was expressed in these plants at a high level. We had other plants that carried the transgene, where the transgene was not expressed at detectable levels, uh, but they were fully immune against the virus disease. So this was bizarre. How could a transgene that is not expressed have an effect on virus resistance, whereas a transgene that is expressed have no effect on virus resistance? Uh, we finally realized that the reconciliation is in gene silencing. Um, in the lines in which the transgene is not expressed, a gene silencing mechanism was operating, RNA silencing mechanism was operating, and this was a mechanism that not only silenced the transgene, but it also silenced the virus, hence the fact that these lines were resistant against the virus disease. And there was a nice irony here because it turns out that what we had done in these transgenic plants was to activate a natural virus defense mechanism in plants. Um, so we and others uh, finally got to understand the mechanism by which this process operated. So the viral RNA um, accumulated in cells. It often accumulated in a double-stranded form. Fire and Mello got the Nobel Prize for discovering the role of double-stranded RNA in RNA interference, RNA silencing. We discovered that this double-stranded RNA was processed into small interfering RNAs and that these small interfering RNAs were then the specificity determinant um, of the RNA silencing mechanism so that nucleases were, able, were guided by the RNA and could target the viral RNA that activated the whole process. This just shows you an experiment here where we've knocked out some of the 
uh, genes in the silencing pathway infected both of these plants here with a virus. And as you can see, uh, the um, mutant plants are hyper susceptible to virus disease. So this RNA silencing, RNA interference mechanism is part of the natural defense in plants against virus diseases. Now this had a number of implications. Um, for us, one was that we could develop a technology based on RNA silencing. So we knew that in an infected plant, when we inoculated the plant with a virus, the infected cells accumulated RNA that corresponded to the viral genome. So, we thought, if we add into the viral genome a fragment of a host gene, in the infected plant, uh, what would happen is that small RNA would accumulate corresponding to the inserted host gene fragment, and this would then allow us to adjust the function of that gene. And so what we could do is a functional genomic exercise in which we took all of the genes in a plant genome, added them into the virus vector, and then systematically asked what was the phenotype of the plant. It's a technology that works very well. This is just an illustrative phenotype here um, in which we have inserted into the virus a gene that is necessary for proper control of flowering. And as you can see, uh, the plant does not flower properly. That's part of the symptom um, of infecting the plant with this virus vector. So, we then followed up that experiment with a sort of what-if experiment. And we said, well, okay, if we um, add in part of the expressed part of a gene, we knock out that gene. But what if we add the promoter to a gene? So, we took some transgenic plants um, that were expressing GFP. When they were inoculated with the wild-type virus, there was no effect. When we inoculated them with a virus, this is an RNA virus, when we inoculated them with an RNA virus carrying part of the GFP promoter, the GFP was silenced. So that was interesting. But what was even more interesting was that when we looked in the next generation, Um, we found that in the progeny plants, although the virus was not transmitted from one generation to the next, the silencing effect was. And the DNA in the promoter uh, retained methylation. So what this showed us was that RNA silencing, um, this together with other extensive analyses, showed us that RNA silencing could not only mediate post-transcriptional effects, they could also initiate epigenetic effects that were heritable from one generation to the next. And I have to say, when we collected seed from these uh, progeny plants and saved them through several generations, the silencing effect persisted for many generations. So clearly, what we've got here is a transgenerational epigenetic effect. The silencing is induced or initiated or established by the RNA from the virus, and then it's maintained subsequently in the absence of that RNA uh, through several generations. So we followed this up, and what this has told us in plants is that the RNA silencing pathways associated with small RNA um, that we and others have um, linked with DISA proteins, with argonaut proteins, and various others, in plants, there are many variants on this mechanism. This is facilitated by the fact that dicers and argonauts and other proteins have diversified in multi-gene families. So in plants, there are many variations on this RNA silencing system. And one of these variant pathways is associated with epigenetic modification. We've focused on this epigenetic modification pathway in recent years. And now we understand quite a lot about the way that it operates. And this is largely based on studies that we've done with the model species Arabidopsis. What happens is you've got DNA here that is transcribed. It produces a transcript. And the transcript is converted into a double-stranded form by an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, the double-stranded RNA is then chopped into small RNA by a dicer protein, 
and that dicer protein then binds to an argonaut protein, and that argonaut binds to transcripts that are attracted, that are, are attached to the chromatin, uh, and it guides the recruitment of a DNA methyltransferase so that the cytosine residues in this DNA become methylated. Um, now, this is all, you could say, molecular biologists stamp collecting and just naming of parts. What is important about this whole process is that it has got an amplification and feedback quality to it. Um, so the polymerases that are involved in transcribing the DNA um, have attached to them proteins that bind directly or indirectly to methylated DNA. So once you've established the methylation marks, um, then the rate at which the polymerases are recruited increases. And so you get more and more of this protein, uh, of this process uh, taking place. Um, so you've got a process here with feedback and amplification. It can mediate gene silencing if the associated regions are adjacent to genes. They're often associated with transposable elements because this is part of the defense system in plants against transposable elements. Now, we had a bit of a dilemma because when we made mutant Arabidopsis, uh, in which this pathway was not active, these plants looked pretty normal. In fact, as far as I could tell, there was no perturbation of growth and development, even under stressed conditions. And so we had to say, well, you know, what's the meaning of this whole process in terms of biology? And that's then when we started thinking about hybrids or genome interactions. And remembering that this process has associated with it feedback and amplification properties, what we hypothesized was that if you brought together two genomes, um, that small RNA from one genome would find targets in the second genome that it doesn't normally have. That having found these targets, it could then initiate the cycle that I've just told you about, result in the production of secondary small RNAs, and that these secondary small RNAs could mediate silencing acting either in cis or in trans. So, um, this is the basis of a lot of our work. This is the thought, the hypothesis, if you like. We've tested this in two ways. One way is by grafting plants together. So uh, those of you who are gardeners or horticulturalists will be aware that you can often chop plants in two and then bring them back together again and the grafted plant will re-establish connections between the two parts and will be fully viable. Um, uh, this became relevant because some work that we had done in the lab a long time ago established that the RNA silencing effect can move around in a plant. And this is a GFP plant um, where silencing was induced lower down on the plant. And what you can see is that the silencing, this is the red color here, uh, is moving out of the veins of the plant. And this is due um, to the fact that the RNA um, uh, associated with silencing is mobile. It can move th between cells through the vascular system of the plant. We've looked into this in some detail by doing grafting experiments with Arabidopsis. And in these grafting experiments, we had GFP as a reporter, and we had a transgene as a source of um, uh, small RNA. And when we looked at the plants, um, in which the small RNA was not being produced, uh, then the GFP is expressed in the roots of these plants. If we graft these roots, the same genotype, um, onto shoots um, that are producing the small RNA, the GFP is lost. And the GFP is lost uh, because, and we could do RNA analyses, I'm not going to go into detail about these RNA analyses, um, using mutant plants and various other um, ways of doing the experiments, but we could demonstrate um, that small RNA was moving out of the shoot of the plant, across the graft union, and into the root of the plant. So the RNA is mobile within the plant. 
uh, initially that was a surprise, but I guess less so uh, in this day and age. And then in the context of thinking about genome interactions, uh, what we did was an experiment where we took two genotypes of Arabidopsis, C24 and Columbia, and we grafted them together. And we wanted to say, um, and we combined this then with small RNA sequencing and um, uh, uh, methylated DNA profiling using bisulfite sequencing of the genome of the grafted plants. And this just shows you at one locus um, that we're looking at here, where in C24, there's abundant small RNA and DNA methylation at this particular locus. In Columbia, um, there's very little small RNA and no methylation. Uh, but when we look in Columbia, um, onto which we have grafted C24, uh, so this is in the Columbia part of the graft, we now find that it looks like C24. So the epigenomic identity at this locus has been transferred by the mobile RNA across the graft union. So this um, supports our general hypothesis um, that um, small RNA can mediate interactions between genomes um, when we uh, bring uh, genomes together. A disappointment in these experiments, if we can refer to disappointments in experiments, because we're all humble seekers after the truth, and if you get the right result, that's success. But a disappointment, uh, nevertheless, was the fact that in these experiments, there were relatively few genes being expressed. And the reason for this is most likely because the wonderful model plant, Arabidopsis, has basically, it's got a very reduced genome. It's got a small genome with very, transpo uh, very few transposons. Its epigenome is relatively inconspicuous. And if we make mutant plants um, in epigenetic pathways, um, that they have very minor phenotypes. Uh, and so, prompted by this deficiency of um, Arabidopsis, uh, we've chosen to move a lot of the work that we do these days into um, tomato. And um, we were more optimistic that we would see um, gene-associated effects because if we use gene editing to knock out various proteins in the pathway associated with RNA-directed DNA methylation, um, we have um, very severe phenotypes. Quite often, these plants have low fertility or are even sterile. So this gave us confidence um, that there would likely be knock-on effects associated with genes um, in, um, in uh, tomato analyses. So rather than doing grafting uh, in our initial round of tomato experiments, what we did was to make hybrids uh, between different species of tomato. Uh, this is cultivated tomato, and in several of the slides you'll see it is labeled as M82. And this is a wild relative of tomato uh, that forms fertile hybrids um, when uh, these species are crossed together. And then what we did was to just try and recall our original hypotheses, um, which was that in hybrid plants, um, there should be small RNA loci and epigenetic changes um, that were absent in either of these parents. What we then did was to look in our hybrids to see whether indeed um, we could see uh, changes that were consistent with this prediction. And we did. Uh, so this just shows you the first of our, our analyses that we published some years ago, looking at the small RNAs. And in this heat map here, each of the columns is a different genotype of plant. Each of the rows across is a different locus within the genome. Uh, at the left-hand side here, we have the parents. And at the right-hand side, we've got various hybrids. In the convention of this heat map, uh, blue is expressed at a low level, red is expressed at a high level, and intermediate colors indicate intermediate expression levels. And I hope it is clear to you from this heat map um, that at many loci, um, there were changes in the hybrid 
that were not evident in the parents. And some of these changes are quite pronounced changes. And what I'm not showing you is that in many instances associated with these changes, there were also epigenetic differences, DNA methylation changes. Now, this brings us back to Pinkerton's blue-eyed baby uh, because um, associated with many of these epigenetic changes, and we've published this work recently, um, we see non-Mendelian inheritance. And the non-Mendelian inheritance that we see um, resembles a phenomenon that is very well known from maize genetics. Uh, and this process is referred to as paramutation. So in the maize genetics, um, you would have a genotype of maize in which um, a gene assessed, associated with pigment production is silent. Um, in uh, another genotype, the very same gene is active and the plant is pigmented. In the F1 hybrid uh, between those two plants, the phenotype is silent. So just think blue eyes, brown eyes, F1 hybrid, blue eyes. B.F. Pinkerton could have had a blue-eyed baby if his blue-eyed um, eye pigmentation gene was paramutagenic. What happens in paramutation then is um, in subsequent crosses uh, with this pl F1 plant here um, and the purple parent, um, one can see evidence that both alleles have now become silent and they've acquired the ability to transfer their silent state onto an active allele. And so the maize geneticists refer to this, as I say, as paramutation. They refer to the pale allele as being paramutagenic and the active allele as paramutable. So once a paramutable allele is paramutated, it too becomes paramutagenic. So it's very definitely uh, resulting in non-Mendelian inheritance. And we could see this at um, our loci. When we crossed, for example, a hybrid plant with the wild-type tomato, you would expect in the F1 generation um, that 50% of the DNA would be active and 50% of the DNA would be uh, epigenetically silenced. And then in the F2 generation, you would expect the normal Mendelian segregation. Actually, what we see at many loci is in the F1 um, that all of the plants, all of the DNA is epigenetically modified. Similarly, in the F2, and if we do a back cross, um, rather than see the Mendelian segregation ratio, uh, we see a predominance of um, uh, of silencing in all of the progeny. So we've got then this um, uh, paramutation-like property um, that is apparently induced uh, by hybridization. One of the loci that we're looking at in connection with this process is associated with pigmentation of the flowers. And we wanted to ask the question, is it likely that RNA is involved in this paramutation-like effect. So what we did was to take um, an RNA virus and add into it a fragment of the promoter um, of this gene. And we wanted to ask whether in the infected plants we could phenocopy um, the paramutation-like phenotype. And the answer was that we could. Um, we saw the loss of pigment, and this is a DNA methylation analysis, and we saw hypermethylation of the DNA in um, the infected plants. So um, this then brings me to my summary. Um, what I hope I've convinced you of is that at least in plants, epigenetic changes can be heritable between generations. I know in mammalian systems, um, this is a question that many people have asked. Um, and I think the answer is not fully um, decided yet. I've shown you that RNA in plants mediates epigenetic changes, and that's certainly true uh, in mammalian systems. 
I've shown you that RNA moves between cells, and in uh, mammalian systems, there's increasing awareness of the importance of circulating RNAs. I've told you about an epigenetic drive effect um, uh, in which epigenetic silencing can have non-Mendelian um, uh, um, uh, non-Mendelian inheritance effects. So hybridization um, in plants is likely to induce epigenetic changes. And one of the questions that we're asking, certainly in, in connection with plant breeding, is whether or not epigenetic variation is associated with hidden heritability. So breeders um, will look at their populations and they can often tie down 40, 50, 60 percent of quantitative trait variation to genetic markers, uh, but um, rarely more than that. And so the question that we're asking is whether epigenetic factors are associated with that hidden heritability. <laughs> so these then um, are some uh, further conclusions. This is a reference to our recent paper describing paramutation-like features of natural epi alleles in tomato. And I just close by again reminding you um, that what we learn from one type of organism is sometimes true of other organisms as well. So with that, I'll close and I'll be happy to take questions. Many, many thanks to Professor Volcombe. He illustrated to us that uh, epigenetic is a uh, reable. It is a, almost a Lamarckian uh, statement. May, may I ask, ask in uh, which perspective we can consider this uh, statement? So then the question is whether or not this is evidence for a Lamarckian type of inheritance process. I would say not, um, because um, Lamarckian inheritance is directed by use. Um, or at least as, um, as, as, um, as portrayed by Lamarck. Um, whereas I think I'm talking about heritable epigenetic changes here that, like genetic changes, can be induced more or less randomly. Uh, they're not necessarily guided um, by um, the use um, in the parental generations. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? One Please. down here. Uh, uh, prima, I, I asked before for Professor Capicchi. Another question? No. OK. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.